All right, well, good evening, everyone. Um, if we can all gather around uh, as much as we can over the virtual connection, we're gonna get started. So just a quick mic check. Anybody with a video on, you can hear me, Erin, thumbs up. Okay. Yes. Great. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Frank Coulter and I'm with SPU. I'm the division director for project management and controls. So I'm really excited to be here tonight. And I mean that when a project gets to this point where we get to go out to the community and talk to them and get their feedback so that they have an opportunity to have a voice in what we're doing, it's really rewarding. So thank you all for being here, especially during what I suspect is dinner for most of you. Um, my job tonight is to keep this meeting flowing. So I'm gonna go through, through the agenda to give you an idea of what's coming. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna wait a second just to make sure there's not a lag on the slide transition. Um, hold tight. Uh, here we go. Thank you. Thank there you for your go. patience. So everybody should be seeing the meeting agenda. Um, we have lots of folks here tonight representing different aspects of the project. I'm not going to go through an introduction of everyone, but I will point out the key speakers. Uh, first will be Alex Chen, the SBU Deputy Director. He'll be providing you with a progress update. This will take about 10 or 15 minutes. <clears throat> and next we'll have Jared Schneider with the King County Office of Emergency Management. And he's gonna be talking about their text alerting system, which also will include a Q and A, and this will be about 20 or 30 minutes. Then I'm gonna talk about the project itself, just a quick orientation, 10 or 15 minutes. And then we'll begin the community input portion of the meeting, which is why we're all here. This will be the remaining hour. Um, some quick housekeeping before we get started. Um, a video meeting isn't the greatest for open-ended back and forth talking. As the presenters are speaking, please put any questions or ideas in the chat and we'll make sure they're documented for follow-up and response. And we're gonna talk more about this in a bit. Um, the presentation will be recorded and posted on the SPU website. And we'll provide that link a little later on. And finally, Aaron and Angie will be managing the Zoom tech. And I'm gonna hand the mic off now to them to provide a few quick tips and tricks. Great, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, this is Angie, I'm one of the two um, people who's managing the, the technology of the meeting tonight. Um, I wanna give you a few Zoom meeting tips and tricks. Some of you have been on Zoom a lot lately, but some of you may be a little um, less familiar. So we wanna make sure everybody knows kind of where we, where we are here. Um, in the bottom left corner of your screen, there is, um, there's an image that looks like a camera. Um, and so clicking on that turns your video camera on or off um, and so you can control whether or not you want to show your face on the screen. Um, during our, our small group sessions, you may want to be on the screen or not, but that's how you control that. Next to the video is an image that looks like a microphone, and that controls the audio. So if there is um, a line through that image, then it will, it means that you're on mute. So when you entered this meeting, you were automatically placed on mute. Um, and we're asking you to stay on mute until there's a time when you're ready to speak, just so that we can limit the background noise um, as we are um, as we're recording this, so that everybody can hear, you know, when when we get to the recording. Also, at the very bottom of your screen is an image of a hand. So if you click on that button at the bottom, you will be um, kind of virtually raising your hand. Um, so when we get to the point when there's an opportunity to ask questions, then you would be raising your hand um, and then we can, we can call on folks in order um, just so that we can speak and share comments. So just as a, as a, little, as a little fun exercise here, let's, let's all try, click on that raise your hand button and we should, we should start to see a bunch of hand counts um, climb. Oh look, 16, 17, 18, great. People are getting it, okay. Um, the, so we can lower everybody's hand, so we'll start fresh. Uh, the last thing that I want to let you know is just to the left of the raise your hand is a little, um, is a button that says chat that looks like a kind of a dialogue box there. That allows you to type questions or comments into the chat box. Um, and then those can see, be seen by other people in the meeting. Um, in the chat, we will also be sharing links and information in the chat. Um, so that's a place where you can, can get some of that information as well. 
Um, if you have any technical issues, you can contact us. You can send a note in the chat. But if you're if you're having challenges with Zoom overall, you can send an email to me at a thompson at envirishes.com, or you can call the number here 206-940-6013. And I will also put that into the chat for um, tech support. And so I think that's kind of all of our getting everybody on the same page. So um, Frank, I think we'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so we're going to move right into this. And our first speaker is going to be Alex Chen. OK, sound check here. Can everyone hear all right and see me? OK, great. Um, you've seen me at a couple of city council meetings, and you'll continue to do so until the project gets uh, implemented and beyond. Uh, but I wanted to start out first by acknowledging some key other folks involved in the discussions here, and then give some background and a status update. The key people I wanted to acknowledge, uh, most of them are here on the call. It's the city mayor, deputy mayor, and council members. Thanks for your continued um, feedback and support, as well as the city manager, Bob Jean, who always gets a call from me right away when something happens out of the ordinary, and city clerk, Mary Medol. So um, we consider you key partners in making sure that we um, maintain a, a sense of trust with the community, and when things happen that we need to fix, that we work through you to repair that trust. So before I give some background here, I did wanna just reinforce, as I have before, SPU's commitment to the public safety associated with the dam. I know that there have been several issues in the last couple of months that have eroded that public trust, and that is a failure on our part. It's a failure we own and we work to uh, improve upon and make sure that you see that we are taking this seriously. So um, what I'll, I'll do is give you some background on what we're doing and how we currently provide the public trust and safety associated with the dam, and then what we're doing to, to continually improve it and learn from issues that we've experienced. So this slide here really just gives a little bit of background on the dam itself. If you were to go about 14 miles upstream on the Tolt River at the South Fork, you'll find this dam, which is an earthen dam built in the 1960s. The reservoir behind the dam holds something like 18 billion gallons of water at its fullest, and that provides about a third of the regional water supply for Seattle and surrounding areas, about 1.5 million people. It also has a hydropower facility on it, um, and the whole thing is regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So when I talk about public safety and maintaining that public safety, we do several things. For example, we talk about 24 seven surveillance and monitoring. So today I'm in the operations control center south of downtown. If you were to walk out the hall, down the hall and open the door, you would always 24 seven find someone monitoring the system. Looking at cameras, looking at the instruments that provide safety, uh, public safety for any issues associated with the dam. In addition to that 24 seven monitoring and instrumentation, we do daily visual inspections with our told crew centered out in Duval that you've probably seen going through Carnation many times. So that means daily instrument readings, looking at the groundwater wells around the dams, looking at visual indicators, in addition to the 24 seven camera coverage. We have through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission periodic um, engineering inspections, both through the FERC as well as through third party independent consultants. Um, and then we have the emergency action plan, which includes how to notify the public of anything going on. That's the focus of today and the discussions going forward. So if something were to happen, there's a number of ways that we would notify the public. So most notably here, you're all familiar with the sirens in town, the four outdoor sirens and the four indoor sirens that are tested weekly on Wednesdays at noon. In the event of an emergency, there's a couple of things that would happen. Those 24-7 uh, operators would verify there was a real issue and activate the system. The sirens would go off. A series of calls would be made to emergency responders, including um, the King County Emergency Office of Emergency Management, Snohomish 911, uh, NORCOM, which is a con consortium of emergency responders in Northeast King County, 
City of Carnation, Riverview School District, National Weather Service. And those calls in turn would initiate additional alerts, including reverse 911 and Amber Alert style um, text alerts, which uh, Jared will tell you about in just a minute, as well as text alerts from the National Weather Service, as well as radio and TV broadcast, the emergency alert system. So that's a little bit of background. And if we could go to the next slide. We've been talking actively at city council meetings ever since we had the 40 minute false alarm that happened on July 28th of last year. And again, we do understand we've been busy listening to the stories of people who experienced fear and uh, confusion and lack of trust in what we're doing. And we're trying to internalize that and improve upon our performance here by working towards an upgraded system and We'll talk about that a little bit more. But that's a continuing theme for us here. So since the January 19th city council meeting, we have continued to try to listen and respond to the feedback we get. Today's community meeting is a way to do that most directly. And in between these, uh, these community meetings, we'll do so through the city council, mayor, deputy mayor, and Bob. But since January 19th, we spent uh, an afternoon out on Evacuation Hill with Mayor Lisk and Council Member Hawkins talking about the system, talking about concerns that they had had and working on potential solutions. One of those solutions was looking at for non-emergency or potential, potential non-emergency situations, implementing a text alert message system similar to the flood alert type me text messaging system that's already in place for those of you familiar, you know, with flooding on the Snoqualmie and the tolls. So Jared will talk to you more about that, but the Alert King County platform is a system you can sign up for to get voluntary non-emergency messages about the dam. We've also put new operational protocols in place, including enhanced testing of the system, as well as making sure that on the weekly Wednesday tests that someone from SPU is there at every siren listening and reporting back any issues that we might experience. We uh, are, will be coming back monthly to report to uh, city council meetings how things are going. So uh, Bob will be get, getting a status report from us um, before those meetings to report on. I'll be there as well as others. Um, so those regular updates, I think, will be a one venue to find out more about what's going on. And the project website, where you see the link here, uh, will also give you a continual place to look to look for status updates um, on anything going on for the project to replace the current warning system, the siren system. And we'll be having these community meetings on a quarterly basis. So with that, um, I see that in the chat, let's see, on the project website, um, Angie's posted the link to the project website. And if it's okay, there's a couple of um, questions on the chat that I could either answer quickly or we could defer to the end. Um, do you have any thoughts here, Angie? I think if you, I think we just have one question in the chat and Alex, I think if you'd like to, to answer it, I, I think go ahead. Yeah, we Absolutely. won't be able to get to all chat questions, but it's a good start. It's a question from uh, Margaret Hindle. Margaret, thanks for the question. It's who decides what the public needs to know? And what we're really trying to do is make sure that the public is aware of anything that they might like to know about. So when we talk about informational updates, um, obviously in the event of emergency, everyone needs to know. In the event of a non-emergency, those who want to find out more, or looking for ways to inform them. And that's the Alert King County uh, text messaging system that Jared will tell you about. The real difficulty sometimes is understanding the difference between a non-emergency and an emergency. It was pointed out to us in January uh, at the city council meeting that when the Wednesday weekly test failed and the sirens did not go off, that um, at the time, um, it was not broadcast out in a larger way. And that's something we're working with our partners at King County Office of Emergency Management on, on how to determine when messages should be this, uh, 
sent through the non-emergency messaging platform where people can voluntarily sign up. And then when messages are true emergencies, when everyone gets those text messages, the reverse 911 calls. So that's where we're trying to go. And I hope that helps answer the question. Uh, there's another question and from Christine, does anyone connected to the dam and its monitoring actually live in the Snoqualmie Valley? And Christine, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, what I will say is that we are part of the fabric of the community, not to the same degree as those of you who live there, but uh, the treatment plant, the reservoir, the whole system up there is right in the backyard of Carnation. Our sirens and our warning system are in Carnation. We work with the city council, city leaders on coordination issues associated with the dam and dam safety. So for example, for me, I've been at SPU for 15 years and I've spent most of those 15 years um, going into Carnation or through Carnation, eating at the Chinese restaurant and shopping at what used to be the QFC and has changed ownership a couple of times. But uh, this is part of, we're part of the fabric of the community, or at least I'd like to consider us part of that. And to that end, we share ownership in making sure that the community feels safe with what we're doing with the safety of the dam. I hope that answers your question. Thank with you, that, Alex. You're welcome. Um, and I, I, now that I mentioned, I, there are a few people who live right in Carnation. Um, I've gotten questions from some of them who are not as involved with this, um, but if it's helpful, I can, we can assemble a database. But with that, I'll turn it over to Jared to tell you more about the non-emergency and emergency messaging platforms that uh, you can sign up for or be aware that you'll get text messaging for. So um, Jared, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Alex. Okay, hi folks, my name is Jared Schneider. I work for King County Emergency Management. I'm a program manager there focusing on hazard mitigation. Uh, one of the hazards in our county is dams and dams fail and dam failure. So um, I'm here today to talk to you about our alert capabilities. Um, but before I get started, Brendan McCluskey, our director is also on, and he wanted to have a couple words off the top of our, uh, off the top of my presentation. So Brendan. Yeah, hi, thanks, Jared. Um, and thanks, everybody, for allowing us the time to be here with you. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I just want to be clear about is, you know, we're a partner there for you. We're a partner of the city. Um, we're completely independent of uh, SPU. Um, we would be there if the siren system wasn't there. And in fact, in situations where uh, there are emergencies that don't involve the dam. We're there to do this alert, alert and warning for you. Um, you know, our, our system, which Jared will talk about in a few minutes, uh, is fairly powerful, and we certainly encourage everyone to sign up for it. Um, but again, I, I, I really want to make it clear that we are completely independent. Um, we're here for you uh, and for the city um, and for the people that live and work and visit your area. So, uh, Jared, thanks, and um, you know we'll be around for questions as well. All right, thanks, Brennan. Okay, if we don't mind going to the next slide. Okay. All right, great. So before we get in and start talking specifically about Alert King County and how to sign up, I actually think it's worthwhile that we dive in and talk about the different alert capabilities that we have in King County Emergency Management. Um, it can be kind of confusing and nuanced, but believe me, it's worth, uh, it's worth taking the time to describe the individual platforms and uh, their capabilities. So the one that you've been hearing the most right now is Alert King County, and that is a reverse 911 system. And um, this system here, it can send texts, calls, emails, TTD and TTY for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. And uh, it can also send app notifications to those in a geofenced area. And if you're wondering what a geofenced area is, um, we have a slide representing that in just a little bit, but essentially all it is is just a polygon drawn on a map that indicates where this message, emergency or non-emergency will be sent. 
So that's the first capability we have, reverse 911. And within reverse 911, there's two types of messages. Um, Alex mentioned them a little bit already, but there's general messages, which you have to opt into. Um, I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Um, but that's the type of message that we would send if uh, in the case of a siren not sounding at the regular time, right? Like not the regular 12 o'clock Wednesday test time. Um, the next type of capability is an emergency message. And that is essentially opt-ins, white pages, yellow pages, and a 911 center database uh, that we have. And we send, we have that same capability of sending text calls, emails, TD, TDD and TDY um, to those folks as well. So that's reverse 911. We also have something called the wireless emergency alert, um, which is WIA. And essentially what this is, is also a geofence system where we can draw a polygon on a map and any cell phone that's in this area will receive a text message. Um, the way that you're probably most familiar with this system is actually through Amber Alerts. Um, it's the same type of process, right? Like you'll be driving through an area or through a state and you'll be like, oh, I got this message. And that's that same capability. Um, I'll also show you an important step in making sure that you can receive those messages too, because you can actually opt out of those messages on your phone. Um, so I'll make sure uh, to show y'all how to do that as well. Um, the last, uh, the last emergency uh, capability that I want to go over is the emergency alert system. You're probably familiar with this one as well as that three tone radio message that you hear, you know, that uh, 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 this is a test of the emergency alert system, you know, in the event of a real uh, emergency, we also have that capability. And so the wireless emergency alert and the emergency alert system and Alert King County is all messages that we would be sending in the case of an emergency or if there was a uh, serious issue at the dam. Um, but now what I really wanna dive into is just that Alert King County reverse 911 capability. So if we can hit the next slide here. And so, as I said before, um, you can sign up for phones, so like uh, actual call, text, email, and then TDD and TTY for folks that are deaf and hard of hearing. And if we go to the next slide. Um, so what this is, you may recognize this town, but this is an illustration of that geofence polygon that I was talking about. So we have a duty officer program here in our office, and those are people who are on call 24 seven, seven days a week. And um, all these duty officers are trained with this capability um, of emergency alert. And so when we receive notification of an issue at the dam, um, we have the ability to draw, you know, just a shape like this, a red shape, you know, on the map and send this message to folks um, who are in our database in that polygon. And so you might've been asking yourself earlier when I was going over our alert capabilities, like why would I wanna sign up for Alert King County when we have the wireless emergency alert system that automatically sends text messages to phones? And here's actually the reason right here. So when you sign up for Alert King County, you have to put in your address. And so if your address you know, is in that red shape, regardless of where you are physically at the moment, you'll receive the alert. So with WIA, Wireless Emergency Alert, you have to physically be in that shape in that moment of time, if that makes sense. So Alert King County really is the best way to make sure that you get a notification um, of anything going on at the dam, um, if you're physically there at that moment or not. So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay. All right. So the best way to sign up is actually online. So if you go to kingcounty.gov slash alert, you'll be brought to the web page um, that's displayed right now on your screen. And then um, if you see that brown box that's bordered by that red uh, rectangle there, uh, click there and it'll redirect you to a page where uh, you can sign up for Alert King County. And the process is pretty intuitive. Um, it walks you through it in a pretty uh, easy to understand way, um, but there's a couple pitfalls I want to point out while while we got you. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, so remember how we were talking about the, the general messages and then only the emergency messages? You need to make sure that you tick the general notifications uh, box when you get to this part of signing up. If you don't text the general, general notifications box, you won't really hear about things like the siren not sounding for its regular test. Um, you will still hear, if you, if you choose to not get those messages, you still will hear about other 
um, emergencies or other issues at the dam. Um, but if you're interested in hearing about, you know, the test or, you know, why didn't sound, um, general notifications is something that you got to tick. All right, next slide. All right, okay, so uh, another pitfall too is, you know, I've also considered before turning off the alerts on my phone when I'm trying to sleep, you know, and you get one of those Amber alerts like really late, um, but it's really the best practice to actually make sure that you have them turned on. So um, you can turn them off in your phone through your settings. Um, so you wanna make sure that those are switched on, otherwise you will not be able to see, receive these alerts. So if you go to your settings, click on notifications, and then, oh, this is for iOS. So in notifications, um, and then if you scroll all the way down, you'll find the government alerts and make sure each of those options are toggled. Um, if you go to the next slide. Okay, and this is the process, uh, that same exact process, but for Android. So in your settings, emergency alert settings, emergency alerts, and then make sure all those options are toggled again. Okay, next slide. Okay. Sorry for the delay. I'm not sure if the slide is transitioned or not, but um, okay. So what this slide is about actually is a new is a new effort that we are undertaking here at King County. So I don't know if I mentioned it in the top of my presentation, but we actually have 127 dams in King County. Um, sometimes people don't realize this, but there's actually a lot. And so one thing that we've heard from Carnation. Um, and others throughout the county is, you know, am I at risk of dam failure? And so what we're doing in King County is actually creating a layer in our GIS online portal called King County uh, IMAP. That URL is down there at the bottom. We'll be, we'll be sharing these resources out too after this call. But if you go to kingcounty.gov slash IMAP, um, we are working on a layer there to where you can see dam inundation areas. It's not complete yet, um, but we're getting close and we'll be sure to provide an update when we do have uh, this layer posted because um, we know folks want to be able to see on a, uh, on a, you know, just down to your own home, right, to see if you have projected risk from dam failure. Again, keep in mind that all these are just, you know, engineering studies and models, but um, we understand that's something that people want. I mean, I want that for myself too, right? So we're working hard on that and we'll keep you guys updated um, when that is complete. So now, um, if you go to the next slide, I believe this is the final slide coming up. And Aaron and Angie, I think this is the time um, where we're gonna have, go through some questions, correct? I saw some coming into the chat, in the mm -hmm. presentation. So yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Angie, it uh, looks like we've got some good questions in the chat. Do we wanna move through a couple of those? Yeah, sure. Um, so there was a comment at this early about um, WEA testing tomorrow at 11 a.m. for an earthquake alert system um, and, and some clarifications that have been going on in the chat around um, people who have test mode enabled will receive that test. So there's a, there's a little bit of back and forth there that, that you can follow. Um, mm -hmm. There is uh, a couple questions I'm going to ask you specifically about the, the alert system, and then we can go back to some of the other questions. One of the questions is about whether the um, WEA and the REV reverse 911 procedures have been improved since the false alarm. Yeah, that's actually a great question. So that is something that we have improved. Um, we've actually uh, pre-scripted those messages into our system already. Now, so um, instead of like us hearing about it and then us crafting a message and drawing the polygons, you know, where the alert should happen, we, we have this all um, coded now into the back end of our system. So in theory, you know, once we receive the uh, notification, we can actually send the message very, very quickly. So um, that's one improvement. We also heard um, that there was a desire to have uh, the messages translated into Spanish. And so reverse 911, it's not to a point yet where um, it can be translated into Spanish, but we, uh, we now have prescripted messages um, for failure in Spanish as well too. So folks, if they you know, have Spanish as their primary language on their phone, 
they'll be getting that message in Spanish. Um, so those are a couple things that we have done um, in response to the events. Jared, another question. Um, someone noted that they're not interested in connecting their phone with the King County Tech Alert. So will they still be able to rely on the siren? Yes, yes. The siren, um, the siren will still go off, you know, in the case of a failure. Yeah, that's something that, you know, we completely understand. Um, additionally, too, you know, um, there will be the EIS, the emergency alert system that goes off that three tone system, you know, that doesn't go over your phone. Um, but yes, um, this is not replacing the siren. This is a supplement uh, to the siren. Um, also a question about whether the area indicated on the map, how that area was determined. Given that uh, Riverview School District spans Duval and Carnation, is it possible for residents of Duval to also receive notifications? Oh yes, uh, so that was just a zoomed in um, area of Carnation, but the alert area is actually much larger, you know, for this type of event. So it's down through the whole Lower Snoqualmie Valley and then up through Duval as well. Um, and I want to go back to a question that was kind of at the beginning of your presentation. Um, the question was, at some point, can someone please share specifically what went wrong um, with the mishaps and how specifically this is being corrected? Was it a person or system error or something else? Yeah, this is Alex and I can do that. Um, the history since July was that there were three issues. Uh, the first one was on July 28th. And if you want more background, the presentations are available, I think, on the City Council website from July 31st or so and July, uh, January 19th of this year. But the first one, in a nutshell, was a pretty catastrophic failure of our siren system. It was a false alarm that happened on a Tuesday at uh, 11 o'clock, 11.20 or so. The sirens went off without any warning. The R operators didn't get our typical verification protocol where there's a note of an alarm incoming. They have 20 minutes to verify the cameras, the instruments, and then the alarm goes off. The alarm just went off. It was traced to a hardware failure in one of our control panels that activates the alarm and that panel since been replaced, but the operators were not able to turn the alarms off, the sirens off for 40 minutes until about uh, noon on July 28th. So that hardware issue has been fixed, but it really set a tone of fear in the community. Um, and I, you know, people here can talk more about it, but we're putting people in a position where they're hearing these sirens that don't sound quite the same as the Wednesday weekly test. And it's on a Tuesday at 11 o'clock. So the message is you need to evacuate because your home will be flooded. So there's a lot of fear and panic that that caused. So that was the first. Uh, the second was about five weeks later on September 9th. It was the regular weekly Wednesday noon test and our operator activated the test, but the sirens did not go off. The reason for that is that we added some hardware upgrades post July 28th to provide additional fail safes to prevent more false alarms. The operator and the operating protocol were not in sync. And so the way the operator activated the alarm, um, the alarm signal never got to the sirens. So, we have rewritten the protocol and we've tre retrained all of our operators who maintain this 24 seven um, monitoring of the system. They're the ones who are also set off the Wednesday noon test. If you fast forward to January 13th, uh, this is a month ago, another Wednesday weekly test failed. The sirens did not go off even though we activated the alarms. And the way the system works is that uh, the communications pathway, the first one is a fiber optic pathway for alarm signals to go back and forth from here in Seattle to the Tolt Dam to Carnation. The backup is a microwave system. The primary system, the fiber optic system, that went down because of all of the storms. Uh, it's a King County fiber optic line and the power to the whole uh, server area went down. So that's why we have the microwave system and that is powered by hydroelectric power. So it's running 100% of the time, whether there's a power outage on the grid or not. What we didn't realize though is that backup pathway, the microwave 
it allowed us to continue seeing the cameras and the instruments. So our operators had the sense that everything is just fine because they can see and hear the typical instruments and cameras. However, the piece that was missing is in the microwave communications, the command to activate the sirens was disabled due to a hardware configuration issue from uh, some testing we had done recently. So we've diagnosed that and fixed it and tested it so that both the fiber optic system and the backup microwave system work entirely uh, 100%. So that's the background to those three issues. Thanks, Alex. I think we have probably one, we got one more question and then we're gonna keep moving. There will be time for additional questions and discussion in our breakout groups. Um, the question is whether we will be changing the test, will you be changing the test siren tone to the actual tone that will be sounded in the event of an emergency? I can answer that. And I, and I think that what we'd like to do is just hear more from the community. There was a lot of um, uh, emotion expressed to us about making sure that we have clear communications with the community. And we definitely understand that. So um, coordination of which tones are used for weekly tests versus emergencies, should those be different or the same? These are some of the things that we want to hear feedback from the community on so that we can make sure that we're communicating as clearly as we can. Great. So as I said, there will be more time for comments and questions when we go into our breakouts, but I think we'll, we'll keep moving and um, Jared and, and Alex, thank you so much for your uh, time to answer questions. And I think we keep moving to Josh. Yeah, one last thing I was gonna say, folks, if you have any questions for me or if you need help signing up for Alert King County, my contact information was on that previous slide. I'm happy to put it in the chat too. Um, so if you feel, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Okay. So thanks, Jared. Thanks, Alex. I'm not gonna belabor this slide. Uh, Alex just went into to great detail on how the system works. Just wanted to put some images to what he was talking about. So this is just a quick Google map. Um, the arrows indicate Carnation and on the left, Seattle. When Alex talks about the microwave systems and the sirens, on the right are the photos of those systems. Uh, on the top, we have a dish. In the middle, we have an outdoor siren. And on the bottom right, just a, a building enunciator or siren. And on the left, again, Alex mentioned that this communicates via microwave as a backup system to the Queen Anne Towers. That's where we have our antenna arrays but primarily through a fiber optic system so that it can communicate where Alex actually is right now. I won't belabor the slide. Again, we went through a lot of detail on this one, so we can just move on to the next slide. So why upgrade the system? Again, it's pretty simple. It was built in 1985. It's a fifth generation system and it's getting old and difficult to maintain. It's outdated tech and needs to be brought into the 21st century. Next slide. So what are our project goals? And now we're speaking to the project that we're working on now. Um, we want to hear your concerns, your needs, and your ideas. Um, we want to listen and we're going to keep you informed. We need to integrate your feedback with our technical goals. Um, our technical goals are to replace and improve that outdated system with a state-of-the-art system. We're going to add redundancy, resiliency, and reliability, and some signage. But ultimately, it's so that we're going to do all of this so that it works for everyone 100% of the time. That's our goal. Next slide, please. So this is a graphical representation of our actual project schedule. I just wanted to communicate some of the major milestones that we're working on. Blue arrows across the top represent a two-year window with each arrow representing three months or a quarter. Uh, the purple bars represent our community engagement. So each blue arrow above the bar represents a meeting with you, the community. As you can see, we'll be coming to you quarterly throughout this year and into the second quarter of next year. And in fact, we'll be reporting back to you in May, the second blue arrow on this bar. The second purple bar, the one titled Regular City Council Updates, our regular city council updates. Um, our next meeting is actually on March 2nd. We'll also be conducting with the city what we call page turn meetings. So as the, as the engineering and the design progresses, we'll be meeting with city staff to review page by page the technical design drawings. It gives them an opportunity to bring their technical expertise to the table and inform what we do. So beneath that, there's a green bar, it's called Siren Design. 
Uh, this is our work to replace the existing sirens. If, if you remember, I mentioned one of our goals to replace the outdated system. Um, we can start some of that work right now by replacing the existing equipment. And I mean the outdoor sirens and horns and indoor horns. So what takes place during this section? Um, we're replacing the in-kind equipment. Um, we still need to do some engineering work. It's not a direct off-the-shelf purchase. We have to do some engineering and enough to submit for an FCC permit, which is that circle of the, the title FCC permits issued for sirens. We still, as I said, we still have to uh, obtain an FCC permit. We expect to have that replacement equipment, which we're going to order now. So we're gonna begin the procurement process for the existing equipment. There's not really a deep design associated. We know what the equipment is. We just have to bring in the new equipment. So we're gonna start that procurement process as quickly as we can after we have the minimal design work done so that we're running two parallel tasks. Once we get our permits, we'll have our design ready and we'll have our equipment ready and we can begin the installation to replace the existing equipment first. We expect that to be done in the second quarter of 22. So finally, the light blue bar. Uh, this represents the design of the entire project. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we need your or input early so that we can integrate it with the technical, technical design requirements of the project. If you align the blue arrows above, you see we intend to meet with you four more times during design and design will be finished by the end of this year, the fourth quarter. We also need to get FCC permits for this design as well. There'll be new locations. They all require FCC permits. Um, a quick note about permits. The FCC doesn't allow an expedited permit process. However, we will work very closely with them to keep the review period as short as possible. This is our realistic projection of how long this might take. We'll do everything we can to shorten this activity. And finally, I just want to acknowledge that this is a high level schedule. I'm speaking in quarters or, or three month intervals right now. As we work with you and your input and we move through the design, exactly what we're going to be installing becomes clearer. And with that clarity become, comes the ability to provide finer detail on dates. In other words, expect to see more specific schedule information as we move through the design. Right, next slide, please. I just wanted to give this quick project overview before we move into the breakout sessions. Uh, do we have time for Q and A or are there any questions in the chat? Okay, great. So let's do that before we go to the next portion. Yeah, there are a couple questions. Um, one question is about whether you're able to expedite the timeline by putting this into emergency upgrade mode. Frank, you're on mute. If you yep, want. sorry. Uh, so <laughs> we're, uh, a little more clear on emergency upgrade. When I hear something like that, what I, what I think of is the procurement process or the procurement requirements that we have. We're doing everything we can to do that. I mentioned that we're in an early procurement phase and we will, if possible, put that under the umbrella of an emergency procurement, absolutely. So that's one of the things that we're attempting to do. I don't know if that answers the specific question or were you taking a different angle on that? If you could put that in the chat, I'll try to respond if I didn't answer your question. Great. Uh, another question about, does the siren need to be tested weekly? Can it just be tested monthly? I think we have, Mike, are you on the call? You're uh, muted. Yeah, can you repeat the question. The question is whether the siren needs to be tested weekly or can it just be tested monthly? Um, I think testing weekly makes the most sense. Um, we, we learn a lot from the tests <laughs> as we've discovered um, from the failed tests. We're always uh, learning and tweaking our system to maximize our readiness. Okay. There's reflections that I think are, are good information for, for you to hear on the, on the siren tones. Um, but a, another question here is, I understand the limits due to the um, timeline, I, uh, the limits to the timeline due to the permit requirements, but um, Frank, is there anything else you can do in the entire process to speed it up? I think that was a little more clarity on that first question. Yeah, so th that is what we're attempting to do. What, again, what I am showing you, I, I admit, is in quarters. We are working with our design consultants to move as quickly as possible. Um, we will finish our design work before we have our permits available to us. So eventually all of these parallel paths are gonna come together. Um, it may, if we receive our permits earlier than we've anticipated, if you can go back to that slide. 
you'll see that I, I don't can't control the cursor, but you'll see that we'll have we'll have that design work commit uh, completed, and there's a gap between when we expect to see those permits. That's the gap we're trying to close. Uh, we'll do everything we can to do that to move as quickly as possible, and we'll keep you updated on that. I don't want to um, overextend the expectations of what what may happen. This is our most realistic um, guess at what may happen, but but we are going to do everything we can to pull in that SEC permit issued milestone. If we can do that then we can begin the installations faster for sure. And that's what we're trying to do. I just don't want to overcommit to you right now or overpromise something we don't control. Um, Frank, there's a couple, there's some folks who are kind of exchanging some feedback on the, um, the verbal message and the tones and some of the words that are used. So that might be useful for the folks when they're going into breakouts to, to dig more into that a little bit. There was a, a question quite a bit earlier that we didn't bring up, and I, I just want to bring it up to you now to see if you have a, an answer. Um, the question is, uh, a person would like to know, in the event of a failure, what path will the water take? And they were interested in trying to determine if additional insurance made sense. So they're trying to figure out a little bit more information about that. I might hand that one off. To, is there someone on the team who can take that question, Mike? We may need to follow up, but. or we will just follow up. Yeah, but yeah. Let's just that. That's got a lot of things in it, a lot of components to it. Let's follow up with that one. We know who asked that. Um, we do. Yeah, so we can we can follow up with that person. We'll we'll send them a note. Okay. Um. Okay. So I think what we're hearing now in the in the chat is some of the discussion around the different tones and the verbal prompts, which seems like a really good. Um, segue into the into the small groups because you're going to talk more about that there. So all right, so this is the community discussion portion of the meeting. Uh, we're going to flip the script a little bit. We've been doing a lot of talking at you, and what we want to do is let you talk to us now, uh, unfiltered. Um, if you remember, I said one of the primary goals of tonight was to hear your hopes, your fears, and your needs, and that's what this is all about. Next, I'm going to hand the mic over to Aaron and Angie for a second, and they're going to explain how the Zoom breakout rooms work. And then I'm going to come back for a quick for a quick uh, few words before we actually go into those rooms. Great. Um, okay. So what we're going to do here, some of you, this might be a new experience in Zoom, but it's going to be fun. Um, so in a few minutes, we will move you into breakout rooms. We'll have a little over half an hour, maybe about 40 minutes um, to spend in those breakout rooms. Each room will have a facilitator who will help um, guide the conversation, document what's been, what's, what you've been talking about. So remember to, you can raise your hand when we're in that room so that you can, you can say words instead of just typing. Um, and you can also type things in the chat. So whichever way is more comfortable, both of those will be things that we will record and we will save um, to be able to, to document the, the conversations and, and to follow up with folks. Um, we will be broadcasting some um, prompts and, and things that'll tell you like how much time you have left in the conversation. Those will show up kind of at the top of your screen in a blue bar. So don't get startled if that, if that shows up. It's usually something that just gives you a little bit. It goes to everybody in all the breakout groups so that we can let everybody know what's happening. Um, if you need to take a break, we've been, we've been here for about 50 minutes. If you need to take a break, you have a couple options. You can always leave the breakout room at any time. And if you click leave room, you will come back to this, what we call this, the bigger room where we all are. Um, and you can take a break. We can put you back in breakout rooms. We can, we can chat with you about that. Um, you also can just turn off your camera and your microphone if you need a minute um, and then come back and pick back up. Um, and when the time is up for our breakouts, then you will, the, the breakout rooms will just close and you will automatically be transported back into this room that we're in here now. Um, and then we'll have about 20 minutes to um, share what each group has discussed. So when we open up these groups, you don't have to do anything. You will just be magically transported through the world of Zoom into these breakout groups. And we have about 10 to 12 people per breakout group. So it's a, it's a smaller discussion. Um, I think I'm not. I think if there's anything I forgot, Frank, jump in. But uh, yeah, just a just a few quick words. Um, I just want to explain what the intention behind the breakout rooms is, is all about. Uh, if any of you have ever participated in a community design session, you might have done it in a large room, like you know, a, a library, a church, a, a school gym, or cafeteria. It's usually free flowing. There's lots of energy. There's tables out. People are manning the tables. There's whiteboards and, and stickies are being posted up, and there's lots of conversation. 
Clearly we can't do that with Zoom right now, which is really unfortunate. Um, so we're trying to recreate that vibe as, as much as possible. And that's what these small breakouts are all about um, with each facilitator. The hope is that you'll find it a little easier to share. It. And like you pointed out, some of the chats that, you're, that are on the side, that's exactly what we wanna hear. That's exactly what we're after. Um, we're, again, we wanna hear your hopes, your fears, your desires, anything about this warning system, anything. Um, nothing is off the table. The project will be more successful if we hear from you. Um, just a quick note, the facilitators aren't technical experts on the system and they can't speak to how it works. Um, they're there to record and, and listen and take notes. Um, this isn't a Q&A, so they won't be able to answer those questions, but we will answer your questions eventually. Um, I, I do encourage you to get them in the chat. It'll be the easiest way for us to record it, but again, we're breaking out so that you can actually talk and, and talk amongst yourselves. Um, and with that, Aaron, Angie, if we can break out into our rooms, let's go. Great. Yeah, can we? Can you review these questions real quick, Frank, just so everybody has those in mind before we? Oh, yeah. So some some guiding questions. If somebody you need some help on, you know, what are we really asking for? And again, it is an open table. We're asking for anything. But but what are your concerns with the existing system? Uh, what's working? What's not working? Can you hear it? Um, do you hear it too much? Where do you hear it? Can you hear it when you're hiking? Anything is helpful to us to know. What's important to you in a new system? Um, do you want additional sirens? Do you want more signage? Um, the more you give us, the more that we'll know about what concerns you, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And that's what we're after. So hopefully these questions, and there'll be some more questions we can ask you, but think, again, think along those lines. Anything is what we want to know. Anything that concerns you about the system, we want to hear it. Great, okay. Everyone get ready. We're gonna open up the rooms right now and you'll be uh, into your breakout room. So here we go. All right, so, sorry about that, Angie. Go ahead. You're up. All right, <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're getting close to the end. Um, and I just wanna give each facilitator a chance to report out on just on some of the things that they heard. Um, uh, I'm just gonna pick a name out of the hat. Chad, you wanna go first? Yes, thank you. A little bit slow on that, the unmute button there. Um, yeah, so I will do my best to capture um, a lot of the, the really good feedback that, that our group um, gave. I'm going to kind of mush them into um, just kind of a, a consolidated uh, set of themes here. Um, we had a lot of content here, and I'll, I'll just try and, and get through them. Apologies if we um, jump around a little bit. Um, but for my group members, I did capture, I think, everything that you said, but I'm just going to try and highlight some of the themes. Um, but really one of the first things that came up was system resilience in the new design. Um, you know, single points of failure uh, from a community perspective, uh, whether it's power failure or technical, um, really weren't acceptable at all um, when we look at uh, new designs and, and they need to be ready for the types of hazards that we expect would impact both the dam and the support infrastructure for it. So uh, windstorms for power failure, earthquakes for the dam and power and, and communications and things like that. So that was really important. Um, there was a lot of, of really good feedback on what the uh, siren system should sound like and what the kind of holistic warning system should also look like. Um, there is value from, from some folks who participated in, in having um, a totally different sound for a real emergency versus uh, something that's really similar to the test message. And other people felt that uh, there needed to be a balance in, the, in how it sounded so that it was familiar but different enough uh, so that you could tell that it wasn't just the same old test message, especially um, if you couldn't understand the words or if um, you know tones were similar but uh, so similar that you couldn't tell them apart. Um, we did get a lot of feedback that verbal instructions definitely have value um, for folks. And that was something that uh, uh, a few people uh, said in our group. Um, and we didn't actually have anybody bring up the fact that they, they only wanted tone. So that was something that uh, we heard loud and clear in our group. Um, we started to talk about um, alert and warning systems in the context of evacuation and traffic management and as well. Uh, there's a lot of work being done um, parallel to this about 
signage, um, but some places were uh, roundabouts in and out of town, key um, intersections as you come uh, to approach town um, from, from the north or south uh, to head people off and let them know what's going on ahead of time. Uh, so captured some details around that. Um, one of the other things that we really heard loud and clear is that uh, it's really important for the design of this early warning system to um, incorporate uh, everything that the community needs. And at the same time, it's just as important that um, professional attention and engagement is, is happening when it comes to the evacuation uh, itself. So there was a, a real request to, to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and I know we have our, uh, a variety of emergency response partners on here that, that are and will, will work uh, on that as well. Um, the, the signage that, that uh, people are talking about and that, that needs to go in needs to be um, highly visible, uh, you know, flashing, lit, big, large. Um, and, and in addition, um, when you're, you're driving in and out of town and the signage system is kind of working, um, our, our group referenced kind of the, the tsunami routes where you identify that you're in the zone, keep moving, you're in the zone, keep moving, and then also to consider having something that says, you're there, keep moving so you don't clog things up, but uh, let people know that they are out of the inundation zone as well. Um, and then I'll try and capture just a little bit more, um, you know, accessibility and evacuation, uh, planning and preparedness for um, people who are older, people who have mobility challenges, um, it is really important. Uh, that's both for being able to evacuate and also to receive the warning. So we wanted to, to highlight that as well. Uh, and last was a really interesting thing brought up by our group. So in addition to um, the, the alerting capability that uh, Jared described to us earlier, and in addition to the siren system, uh, with as fast as technology is evolving, uh, it was brought up, is there a way as we move forward for uh, warning systems like this uh, whether it was uh, siren uh, based or whether it was, um, you know, something like the county has to integrate with a variety of different devices where people could set something up more customizable uh, in their homes if the device they use isn't always their cell phone and they have a number of different types of uh, things in their house that could provide some kind of message or warning. So um, there was a ton of great feedback in our group. I tried to capture some of the highlights here. There's a ton of other things that I'm looking forward to digesting with, with our group, uh, but I really wanna thank everybody in our group for um, providing all of the great information that you did. And uh, Frank and the rest of the team, I think that's all I have for now. Great, thanks, Josh. Um, Josh? Hi. Right? Yeah, uh, I feel pressure to ask all my the great questions my uh, my breakout room asked. So I'll do my best to summarize. Um, I had questions about the inundation map um, uh, and some good specific questions about the inundation map. Um, great, great questions about integrating the project with other efforts that are ongoing in the community for um, information sharing, social media sharing. Um, uh, general emergency preparedness. Um, got questions about physical markers. So is there ability to have um, physical markers in the city to know when you are, uh, when you have properly evacuated uh, on both sides of town? Uh, questions about signage, um, potentially lights and signage. Uh, questions about messaging um, and flexibility around messaging. Got some great questions, um, you know, about using, leveraging social media. Uh, it's a part of our lives now. So how do we get the word out um, on how the evacuations work uh, using social media? Questions, um, you know, about locations, um, leveraging the roundabouts in town um, on both sides, just to make sure that uh, folks that are coming into town um, are not contributing to the evacuation problem, um, getting folks out. And we got some questions specific to the dam, uh, which was very interesting. The amount of water we have in the dam, who's using all the water in the dam, and could the, the levels be potentially reduced um, to potentially reduce some risks? 
And then a uh, question similar to Chad's with um, leveraging simple low cost technologies with the new system, uh, connecting the, the new system in with an 800 megahertz radio, ham radio, a NOAA alert radio, um, potentially uh, an AM radio station uh, like we see on washdot roads. I think that fairly summarizes uh, the questions from my group. Thank you, Frank. Josh, all right, um, Fred. I want to say you're muted, but I can't see your friend. I was muted, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, well, I only have a couple of people from the community in the breakout room, but we had great discussion and, um, you know, a good question. Um, the, um, Here's one of the common theme, uh, just listening to, um, to the two very active participants of the, uh, in, in the break room, um, is more or less um, around the, um, the reliability of the existing you know, sirens um, and how in one case it took roughly about 50 minutes before this community member were able to know that the alarm was false in the first place. Um, so there was that issue that came out really clearly. Um, and there's also the concern about, you know, the sound, you know, sounding really muffled. Um, I guess this, you know, probably depends on where you are, you know, um, either, you know, uh, elevation wise, but that was an issue. Um, the traffic control was the other, you know, um, very critical issue that was raised. Um, that everything seemed chaotic and with some people going the wrong direction. Um, so that's another major thing that uh, came across that we'll be, you know, um, looking seriously as we, you know, um, move forward with our design finalization. Um, the inundation map, um, you know, uh, came up as well um, in a different way, but it was uh, a concern raised by an individual that has horses on the, fan, on the farm uh, pad, how he didn't know whether to move the, uh, the horses on the higher ground and uh, also not knowing how much time you know, um, that he, that is required of him. Um, so that came across loudly and very clear. Um, apparently there have been feedback to some community members that uh, the interest in, uh, in uh, uh, seeing or having the inundation map, um, you know, it has to do with some security concern and the feedback is, um, you know, we should, you know, consider relaxing that a little bit. Um, after all, um, all we're talking about here is, you know, uh, their lives. Um, now, in terms of, um, you know, um, you know, what they, they have for us relating to um, the new system, um, I, I think the test, the test platform is a hit, you know, uh, for obvious reason. And that um, with such a, a technology or platform, um, you know, people will know quickly if, if an alarm is false because they can readily, you know, receive that and be able to get the message, you know, uh, uh, much more quicker. And, Finally, with respect to uh, the new system that is being designed, that we should be mindful of the, uh, the potential impact of tall buildings, you know, um, encroaching on the functionality or, or performance of the, uh, of the siren system. Uh, those were some of the stuff we, uh, we talked about or came across uh, very clearly during the discussion. Thanks, Fred. Um, I can go next. I'll recap our group. Uh, I won't capture everything, but 
had no clue we were taking copious notes and we have everything in, in, the, in the chat. We, we too had conversations around audibility. Um, maybe the type of sound uh, could, could differentiate between testing and, and the final, the actual emergency alarm. Um, there was a note that it was uh, kind of a mystery. Sometimes, as Fred said, you could hear it great, and sometimes it was muddled. Um, so there's something there that we've heard, so we've heard that a couple of times now. We definitely had a lot of conversation around signage, um, signage for pedestrians and hikers. There was a, a comment about the trailhead at Northeast 50th that gets blocked a lot by cars, uh, but to make the point that we need to improve that signage for folks who are there. Um, also, the roundabouts and highway signage, maybe moving to electronic signage. Uh, and, and the tsunami was also uh, on the Oregon coast as a great way to let people know where you are in relation to the zone, um, just to know if you were entering it or leaving it and what you need to do, that that was a great example of something that could be done. Um, uh, there was actually concern about you know the visitors. You get a, a, a lot of visitors that come in in the summer, they're floating, uh, they're hiking, and how do they get informed uh, about uh, the zone that they're in and what they might need to do, as well as business owners. There was an idea of, of maybe working with the business owners to make sure their staff are informed uh, of an emergency action plan or something that might need to happen. Um, so, so those were some of the differences. We had a long conversation. We've got it all captured. Um, but with that, let me see. We have Karen, I think. Um, I can go, Frank. Did you say Carrie? I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to um, just hit some high points and not talk about some of the stuff that we talked about that's similar to what's already been said. Um, we talked for a bit about the seriousness of, of what happened in July and the fact that, you know, the two follow-up issues that we had with getting the alarm to sound and how that impacted people's lives. And we talked about the need to expedite the work. Um, you know, that 2022 feels like a really long way away. We talked about the potential for, you know, getting some wins between now and then and getting some things accomplished that um, address some of the issues, um, you know, in the interim. We talked a lot about how the alarm sounds in different areas of the community. So someone pointed out that Carnation has grown quite a bit since these alarms were placed. Um, in 1985. And so we need to um, think about the way the community has grown when we think about the placement of alarms. Um, also a lot about audibility, both of the alarm itself and the language that is that comes out after the alarm. Um, got a lot of good ideas there that we um, that are recorded and then also about signage and a lot of discussion about, you know, how to evacuate and how we can help the people who live in Carnation be more prepared. Um, we talked too about um, visitors, people camping in the park, in the King County Park, and how they might need some information. Um, we talked about the um, population of Carnation on the western end of town and how they might need some um, special attention to how they would evacuate. Um, we talked about doing um, some investigation into, um, well, I addressed this already, doing some investigation into how the alarm sounds in different parts of the city and that people who live in Carnation and people who were on this call might be willing to volunteer to help with that. Um, and we talked about more you know, communication that SPU can provide along with King County and the city of Carnation about emergency preparedness and, and how to behave in the event of an emergency. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So I just have some some final thoughts. First, just thank you everyone for sharing. Um, our next steps is the project team is going to gather all of this feedback. And we're going to organize it and begin the process of folding it into our project. Um, we'll be reporting back to you. I told you we'll be back to you, uh, I think, in May. And we'll let you know how we're proceeding with that. Um, and just some final things. If folks were, if you know of somebody that wasn't able to attend, remember, we've recorded this session. We're gonna post it up on our website. Um, we'll also be posting all the feedback that you've given us. We're gonna put it into a different format so that we can get it up onto our website and you can take a look at it. Um, you can subscribe to our website for updates. You can join an email distribution list, or you can just go to the website and look at our contacts and give us a call. If there's something that you have a question about, we'll get back to you for sure. Um, with that, unless we have anything else to add, I'm going to close the meeting. Erin? 
I think you, you I think you covered it all, Frank. Um, Angie is just putting the links um, in the chat one more time for everybody to the project website and alert King County. So um, you can click on those and, and have direct access. Great, thank you. So thank you everyone for taking time out tonight to join us. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you again in May. Thank you.